deal here. So our main talk today is by Chris Pike. He's a research scientist at the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. Chris began working with the Alaska Center for Energy and Power, or ASEP, in 2012, and has been involved in projects ranging from studying the performance of solar thermal systems in the Arctic, geothermal ex exploration in Western Alaska, and has been working as part of the data collection and analysis team. Since 2017, he has worked as part of the solar technology program team to improve our understanding of the performance of solar photovoltaics in the state and learn more about ways to reduce the cost of this technology in Alaska and in the far north. Joining, uh, I am joining Chris uh, and uh, will be <laughs> handing the scene to him shortly. And we are also joined by Lauren Chris Carboy of Information Insights. She will be running the polls, helping with keeping track of the questions that you may have and helping with everything Zoom related. Talking of Zoom, let me go to the next slide. Um, we will cover, I will cover some Zoom basics, but let's do a poll. We will be only asking you to do two polls tonight. One is to figure out where all of you guys are from. Since we are using Zoom, this allows us to reach a wider audience. And so you should have just seen pop it up on the screen. If you have an older version of Zoom, you will not see the poll. So you can just put uh, the answers into the chat. And the question is, the questions are, where are you from? Number two is, how did you hear about this class? So we will share the results a little bit later, but right now we have seven people from Fairbanks, two people from North Pole, one person from Matsu, one person from Anchorage, one person from other. And how people heard about this it includes both CCHRC social media, GBA social media, and newsletter. AHFC, that's Alaska Housing Finance Corporation, social media, and the ASAP Weekly Newsletter. So, Lauren, I can, uh, I'll let you uh, <laughs> close the poll at some point. In the meantime, I'll go over the Zoom basics. Please mute yourselves or we will mute you. In order to do that, um, either hover over your name and you should see the mute unmute button or click on participants and then you should see your name. Uh, we may or may not take a break, it depends. You can feel free to raise your hand anytime or better yet put a question into the chat and we will try to answer those questions as we get to it. To raise a hand, uh, it is under reactions, I believe. And again, unlike other classes, we will not be sending out uh, any certificates. This class will consist of a presentation by Chris Pike, and then Lauren will share a few slides about the solar ice campaigns in Alaska, and we will have a long question and answer sessions. Lastly, if there is interest, I may show some examples of a more detailed model available on the web. So with that, I'll stop sharing and I'll let Chris take it away. Great, thanks, Dana. Um, with that, I will go ahead and share my screen here. Are you guys seeing the full screen or is it the, uh, the presentation mode? Currently it's full screen. Oh, great. Okay, perfect. Well. Um, or it, it does show the other slides on the, on the oh, left. It's the presentation mode. Okay, hang on just a minute here.
Okay, how's that? Looks great. Great. Uh, okay. Um, perfect. And I'm just going to do this real quick. Okay, can you guys see the pointer? Yep. Perfect. All right, thank you everybody. Um, and thanks to our sponsors for uh, supporting this event. Uh, again, my name is Chris Pike. I'm with the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. Um, first, a little bit about uh, our organization. Um, we are a research organization um, based at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, our mission is to foster and de foster the development of practical, innovative, and cost-effective energy solutions for Alaska and beyond. Really what that means is we try to uh, do research that really improves the lives of, of Alaskans and helps to lower the cost of energy in the state. Um, some of those programs uh, involve the things listed here. We have our hydrogen, or sorry, our hydrokinetics. I've been doing a lot of hydrogen work recently. We have our hydrokinetic research center. Um, they really do a lot of research about uh, the emerging, emerging hydrokinetic technology, which is essentially how you can um, harvest energy from rivers without actually impounding those rivers. So they have a test site at Nanana. Um, we have our power systems integration lab um, located at UAF there. They actually have a lab that um, can imitate a, a small uh, islanded grid like you would see in villages throughout Alaska. Um, we have our data collection and analysis program, uh, which is exactly what it sounds like. We try to collect data, especially energy data from around the state. We have our solar technologies program, which is what I spend most of my time in. Um, and we also do work in biomass, wind, and a host of other technologies. So uh, if you want to learn more, I encourage you to either get in touch with me after the presentation, or you can check out our website, and there's lots of information on there. Um, I'm gonna probably talk for about 20 to 30 minutes and then I'll stop and see if we have any questions, um, see if folks need a break. Um, if, if you do have questions as I'm speaking, feel free to throw some questions in the chat. Um, and if I don't see it, uh, the moderators can, uh, can interrupt me and uh, ask them as I, I kind of move through the presentation. Um, but again, thanks for, uh, thanks for taking some time out of your evening to join us here. Uh, we're going to start with just a real basic, um, oops, let's try this. We're going to start with a really basic uh, slide here first, and we're going to talk about energy and power, because what I find as I, as I go through these presentations, oftentimes is I use uh, watt, words like watt and kilowatt and kilowatt hour, uh, like it's, you know, some vernacular that everybody uses in their daily lives, and uh, forget that um, in for most people, these are not words that they're using every day, despite seeing them on their electrical bill and, um, uh, you know, being obviously being involved with them as as you turn lights on and off. Um, but uh, I think it's important to understand what what they mean. Um, a watt is a unit of power, um, and so you you know, oftentimes when you look at light bulbs, you might see it's a hundred watt light bulb, um, meaning that if you uh, turn that light bulb on, uh, it's going to have a power usage of 100 watts, um, and watts is just a measure of power. Um, a kilowatt is just 1,000 watts, and then the most important of these terms is kilowatt hours, because that's what we actually pay for on our electric bill. And so um, it, basically kilowatt hours is power and then with the time component. So power and then how much time you've used it for. So if you use a 100 kilowatt light um, for 10 hours, 10 time, 100 times 10, that's 1000 watts or one kilowatt hour. Um, and that's gonna be, that's in Fairbanks, that's gonna cost you about 25 cents. Um, if you're in Anchorage, that might be about 21 cents depending, uh, depending upon uh, what quarter of the year it is. Um, the other thing is when I talk about watts a lot, a lot of times I'm talking about the installed capacity of a, a solar or a PV system. Um, and so again, that'll, that's just a reference to how much that system can produce um, at an instantaneous moment if the conditions are, um, are optimal. Um, so 
I'm going to be using these terms a lot. If it gets confusing, feel free to stop me and I can try to explain it more, but I just wanted to start with that. Um, and before we really get into the meat of the, P, the meat of PV, it's actually great to hear that uh, the last presentation was uh, energy efficiency, because um, that's really where we should start um, the conversation. Uh, a PV system in Alaska could cost you anywhere from $5,000 on up, uh, maybe up to $20,000, depending upon the size of the system or even more. Um, so that's a, a significant chunk of cash uh, to lay down. And the reality is, is that oftentimes simple things like energy efficiency and changing out light bulbs and things like that will have a much quicker payback than uh, uh, installing a PV system. Uh, so steps for success include making sure that you take care of efficiency first. Um, this, this slide is a little dated because I would hope by now most people don't have any incandescent light bulbs left in their house and they've all converted those to LEDs. But if you do have incandescent lights, uh, I encourage you to switch them out because it is a very quick payback. Um, the next uh, important step for success if you're thinking about installing a PV system yourself is to collect data and perform some simple modeling. When we say collect data, uh, generally what we're talking about is um, uh, accumulating your electricity bills so that you can track exactly how much electricity you're using on a monthly basis. And then you can look at a program called PV Watts and see what size of a system would be appropriate for your electrical consumption. And later in the presentation, we'll go through some of the steps to talk about that. Um, if you're going to install the system yourself, you really need to contact your utility before you get started. Every single utility on the rail belt uh, now has uh, very useful um, web pages that specifically talk about net metering and about the process that you need to go through to install a net metered system um, or to generate your own renewable energy. Um, so I really encourage folks to take a look at those and um, to, to make sure that you understand them and to talk to the utility to make sure there's not going to be any roadblocks down the road. Um, the worst thing of all is to spend money on a bunch of equipment and then realize that um, maybe you're not going to be able to install it or you're not going to be able to install it exactly how you had hoped. Um, so to make sure that those surprises uh, don't creep up. Um, if you are going to uh, hire someone to install this for you, they really should be uh, doing the things like talking to the utility and dealing with permitting uh, themselves. I would, if you do encounter an installer that wants you to go uh, pull a permit or that wants you to go to the utility, um, I would, I would probably encourage you to ask around or at least get another quote because really that should be the, uh, the job of the installer. And then uh, finally, these are kind of the four main things that, that I'll touch on in this presentation. We'll talk about the components of a PV system. Um, and when I say PV, that stands for photovoltaic. Um, and I kind of use PV and solar somewhat interchangeably um, as I think most people in the industry do but you'll hear me talk about PV panels and solar panels and modules. And we're kind of referring to the same thing uh, when we say that. I'll talk about the solar resource. So basically how much solar energy we can harvest uh, in different parts of Alaska. And then I'll talk about some of the financial aspects of it. And then finally, we'll leave you uh, with a bunch more resources that you can um, look into to, to continue your, your PV education if you want to learn more. Um, this is a, a really well-known slide. I think you probably see it in pretty much every solar presentation in Alaska. Um, we're pretty, you know, everybody loves to um, look at Germany because they've been a real success when it comes to solar. Um, for a long time, they were leading the world in the amount of solar that they had installed. Uh, they invested early through um, favorable policy and um, really encouraging solar for uh, building rooftops and other places. Um, but when we actually look at their solar resource, their solar resource is, um, is much worse than pretty much any other place in the lower 48. And it's actually on par with what um, we see in Alaska or many places in Alaska. So it's, it's kind of a, um, a demonstration that if uh, solar can be successful in a place like Germany, it can be successful in a place like Alaska as well. Um, some basics about how solar works, and I'm not going to go into into detail about um, 
uh, semiconductors or anything like that, but kind of what's helpful to understand is that PV cells are a semiconductor. Usually they're made of silicon. Um, and a cell is uh, basically this thing down here in the lower left that you see. Um, these cells are wired together to make up a solar panel or a solar module. They're the same thing. And basically what happens is light from the sun um, hits that solar, solar panel um, and it, it knocks an electron loose. Um, and it forces that electron uh, to travel through a circuit, which uh, where that electron where that electron or electricity can be harvested uh, to do some work. Uh, in this particular image, the work is to light a light bulb, or you can make it turn a motor or something like that. Um, that's the the down and dirty, and that's honestly about all you need to understand. Uh, pretty much ever, <laughs> unless you were going to be designing solar panels yourself. Um, when we look at different parts of solar panels, um, you'll see here are the modules or the panels, um, like I just spoke about. Um, those are obviously held up by racking. Uh, that racking, and I'll talk more about each of these components individually. Um, from there, uh, solar panels produce a DC form or direct current electricity. Um, and what we use in our house is generally alternating current or AC electricity. Um, that's what the utilities provide for us. And so that's what our televisions use. And um, that's all, it, it's, it's, it's what everything uses. Although uh, a lot of our uh, computers nowadays actually use DC. So it kind of, it gets rectified back to DC after it's uh, AC, but um, I'm getting too into the weeds there. There's also um, a disconnect that all the utilities will require. Um, and again, this is another one of those examples of where if you're gonna be installing these systems yourself, you need to make sure and talk to the utilities because the disconnect requirements is different from utility to utility and each utility has a certain way that they want those disconnects wired and they have a certain type of labeling that needs to be on the disconnects and uh, the meters. Um, oftentimes to connect that uh, electrical system into your home, uh, it's connected into the breaker panel right here. And then from there, uh, the breaker panel is obviously connected to a utility meter. Um, all the utilities uh, with one exception um, will only have one utility meter. Um, when there's a PV system on the house, it's a bi-directional meter. So it can measure uh, the utility going, or the, the meter going forwards or backwards. My understanding is that uh, in GVA territory, they actually, uh, put another meter generally about right here, which measures um, solar output um, exclusively. Um, so that, like I said, each utility is a little bit different. Um, and then the things that aren't, uh, that aren't shown on this diagram that are really important um, is the monitoring system. Um, monitoring system is basically a part of your, um, uh, of your PV system that is going to tell you exactly what those uh, solar panels are producing. It allows you to track to make sure everything's performing as it's supposed to. Um, usually when folks first get uh, their PV arrays installed, they're, they're looking at their phones a lot because you can check these systems on your phone and uh, see, see how things are performing. After a while, it kind of just becomes something that you kind of ignore and it just works, which is, which is really one of the beauties of uh, of solar. So starting with the modules, because that's where, uh, that's where the sun actually hits. Um, this system is actually on my house. Um, I used to live in Fairbanks. Um, I'm currently located in Anchorage. Um, and I should say that I, a lot of the examples I give in this presentation are from Fairbanks. Um, and it looks like that's where the majority of the folks on online are joining us from. However, um, I'm going to talk about lots of different areas of the state, and uh, we can easily talk about other areas if, if folks, folks have specific questions. So this particular system is what you would call a flush mount system. Um, you have some racking down here, and the racking is attached to the roof through with some connectors that I'll talk about a little bit more. And then the panels are installed uh, at the exact same tilt angle as the roof, so it's flush mount. Uh, with just a couple of inches between the roof and the back of the panels. Um, 
and you can barely see it here, but there's a wire that goes through some conduit um, that then goes around uh, and goes down the house where it connects to um, some of the other components. Um, some of these are examples of ground mounted systems. And obviously these are much larger ground mounted systems. Um, but um, the interesting thing about these particular systems is they, you can see two different types of solar panels. On the top here, you can see a bifacial uh, panel. I'm sorry, a monofacial panel. Um, monofacial meaning it just has one side. So it can absorb um, a radiance from the front side of the panel only. It's got an opaque back sheet um, so it's not going to be able to absorb any of that ir uh, irradiance from the rear side. Uh, and the bottom here, this, um, and I should say this, this particular um, system right here is in Willow, Alaska. Um, so about uh, an hour north of, of Anchorage. This particular system right here is in, out in Kotzebue. These are both larger uh, utility scale systems, but the racking would look uh, very similar, um, you know, in even if it were a smaller system. Um, and this particular, the interesting thing about this particular system here is that it's a bifacial system. So it uses what are called bifacial solar panels. So that uses a clear back sheet. And so you can, you can actually see the solar cells right here um, through the back of the panel. And so it has the ability to absorb a radiance um, both from the front and the rear side of the solar panel. And that can be really useful in a place like Alaska. Um, for folks that go outside on a bright sunny day right now, pretty much anywhere in the state, uh, you better bring your sunglasses because it's very bright and there's a lot of uh, uh, a radiance that bounces, about, bounces off the, the bright snowfall because that snow has a very high albedo. Um, it's very reflective. Um, so you can really uh, improve your performance if, uh, if you have a ground mounted system that uses bifacial modules. Um, I have down here, we have a, we have a solar test site in uh, Fairbanks on the UF campus. Um, it's a very small test site, but that test site found a 21% um, gain between bifacial and monofacial. Um, for larger systems, it may be closer to 10 or 15%, but it's still a significant figure. The other interesting thing about bifacial is even when the front of the solar panel is covered with snow, they can still generate energy um, from the reflected radiance that strikes the backside of the panel. So that's pretty cool as well. These, um, these are some of the, uh, the spec sheets that you'll see. These are actually um, some pictures that I took of the, the little labels that are just on the back of the modules. Um, so when you're comparing modules, uh, you can actually take a look at these and you know someone will say it's a it's a 270 watt module or it's a 400 watt module so um, what does that actually mean um, that is the rated output at what they're called stc or standard test conditions and you can actually see here um, right here it says nominal ratings at stc and it says uh, stc is 1000 watts per meter squared there's some other information here and then at 25 degrees Celsius. And so that's really what you need to know. Um, we are frequently colder, 25 degrees Celsius. So uh, I think that's about 78, 75, 78 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, obviously in Alaska, it's frequently a lot colder than that. Um, solar panels will perform above, sometimes above their rated outputs um, during, uh, especially during April, during the current month. Um, because you see higher radiance uh, levels and then you see very cold temperatures um, and solar panels are more efficient at cold temperatures. Um, this is the spec sheet for a bifacial module right here. And um, the interesting thing here is um, you can see at STC, it's rated to 405 watts. Um, but then they have these two other columns. And what that says is um, that's giving you the measured output if, um, <clears throat> if the panel is under standard test conditions and there's a radiance striking the backside of the panel as well. So this first column where you see by phi 100, so they're saying if the front side of the panel is getting 1,000 watts per meter squared and the rear side of the panel is getting 100 watts per meter squared, then you can expect an output of about 430 watts. And then if the rear side of the panel is getting 200 watts per meter squared, 
then you can actually can expect an output of about 455 watts. So um, if you if you do if you if you are interested in bifacial panels, they are a little bit more, um, but at least now you, you should be able to, to look at a spec sheet and kind of know what some of those numbers mean. Um, the other type of solar panel that you might see is what's called half cut panels. Um, the advantage of half cut panels is they do better if under partial shading conditions. So this is actually a, a a screenshot that I pulled from a Canadian solar ad, um, but it, it's a good demonstration. Generally, if you have a shading that covers about a third of the module, um, as, as it's kind of demonstrated here, even if it's only a couple of cells here, it's going to take, it's going to um, eliminate the power production from one third of the module based upon the, the electrical design of how that module works. Um, if you have a half cut, a module that uses half cut cells, um, basically what you have is you have the two sides of the cells, excuse me, the, the top and the bottom of the, um, of the module are, are, wire, are wired together in parallel. Um, so if you have some shading on the bottom third of the module, it's only gonna um, eliminate about one sixth of the module rather than one third of the module for, for a traditional module. So again, uh, half cut panels uh, are going to be a little bit more expensive. They are coming down in price, um, but it's something that you might want to look into if you have an area that um, might see significant shading or something like that. <clears throat> so after our, uh, after our solar panels, um, the next thing in our um, in our design is going to be the inverters. Um, the inverters are what take that uh, that DC power that comes off the solar panels and turns into the AC power that we that can be used in our homes. There's generally two types of inverters that are, that are going to be used on uh, on home arrays. There's what are called uh, string inverters that look similar to this one right here. String inverters um, will um, invert the power production from the entire string of solar panels that are either on your roof or maybe on a ground mount. And they're gonna um, connect all those panels together and invert them, invert that power as, as, as in bulk basically. Um, whereas um, there's microinverters, uh, like you can see on this side, um, these are actually on the back of the solar panel. Um, so this is a ground mount system, which makes it easy to actually see the, the microinverters. Microinverters um, will invert the power panel by panel. Um, it can be a little bit more expensive, although most uh, installers in the state are using microinverters for, for smaller um, home-based systems. Um, the real advantage is that if you have, if, if that one panel is shaded, um, that panel is not, isn't going to bring the, production of the rest of the system down. Um, if you have a string inverter and one panel is shaded, then because those panels are wired together in series, the, um, the, the rest of the panels are also going to be affected. So for areas where there's no shading, um, it's not a big deal. Um, most home-based systems have shading of some type or another just because it's, a, it's an area that's optimized to live in and not an area that's completely optimized uh, for solar arrays. So this is what they look like. Um, some, there's lots and lots of companies that make, uh, make these string inverters. The two biggest companies that make these microinverters are, um, Enphase and AP Systems. Um, it's kind of like a Ford or a Chevy, in my opinion, certain installers like one or and certain installers like the other. Um, right here is kind of how they're going to look, um, when you look at a line diagram on your system. So here's the string inverter. You can see that you have the whole string of panels wired into that string inverter. And with microinverters, you can see that uh, each solar panel, um, the power from each solar panel is inverted separately. The third kind of uh, inverter, which um, I didn't have a picture of, but it, it's, it's, it's called, um, well, it's a string inverter, but it uses power optimizers. Um, Solar Edge is the big company that does this. Um, it actually is what I have on my, my own system. Um, 
So you have, and it's a combination of both. Basically, you have a, a small optimizer on the back of each panel, and that um, uh, has a DC output, and then it goes to the main, uh, it goes to the main inverter here, and um, then the inverter again is what um, inverts that from DC power to AC power. So you have three different things to choose from. Again, most uh, small home systems will go with microinverters, but you don't have to. There are some other systems out there. Um, so for racking, we got to hold these things up somehow, um, whether it's for a ground mount array or for a rooftop array or even for a pole mounted array. There's a lot of different options out there. Um, these systems right here are obviously ground mounted. They also are ballasted systems. So for these systems, um, for for whatever reason, they didn't actually want to um, plant, you know, structure into concrete in the ground. They didn't want to have to do a bunch of digging. Um, <clears throat> so they uh, they used weight to essentially hold these things in place. Um, and the amount of weight that was needed is based upon the wind loads that they expect. Um, and this system here on the left. Uh, this is a four kilowatt system. It's located out in Bethel, um, and they just use sandbags to to weigh this down. Um, the system here on the right is a, a larger system in the community of Norvik. It's actually a bifacial system. If you kind of look at the back of the panels, you can see that. Um, <clears throat> and they they also used dirt uh, in some some purpose built containers there that um, that hold those those modules down. This is an example of a pole mounted system. Um, this array is out in the community of Eagle, um, but you'll see very similar systems throughout Fairbanks and throughout the state. A lot of times homes might just have one of these poles um, with the 12 panels on them. Um, it's a very common design. Um, some people like these uh, because they feel like uh, they're more compact and aesthetically they might look a little bit better. Um, sometimes you'll see examples of these where they can track the sun. And I'll talk a little bit about tracking later, um, uh, but they're pretty simple uh, systems to install. And basically you generally have either a six or an eight inch piece of pipe that you plant in the ground. Um, and then you have the, the modules that are installed on some, some purpose built racking. <clears throat> and these are all examples of roof mounted uh, types of, uh, of racking. Here on the left, you can see this is it actually the racking before the solar panels are attached um, on, a, uh, on a shingle roof. Each of these connectors right here goes under two courses of shingles. And um, then it's flashed in such a way that water can't, uh, can't get it into these holes. Um, <clears throat> and then these are lag bolted into the actual rafters of the roof so that it physically becomes part of the structure of the roof. Um, and the, actual, the, the, the number of uh, connections that need to be made to the roof are dependent upon the wind loading that is expected in the particular area where the solar is installed. Um, these two, th this, one, this system here on the bottom left and the system here on the top right are both on metal racking. Um, these are actually these two systems are actually located up in Bear Valley. Um, it's a system. It's it, it's by far the windiest area of Anchorage, and um, I used to live up there. And every single year that I was there, we had uh, at least one day where the winds exceeded 100 miles per hour. So it, it's a testament to um, the durability of solar when it's installed well. It, it it can withstand some pretty extreme conditions if if it's designed and installed correctly. And then this system right here, um, I forget which community is in, uh, might be Deering, although I forget. But anyway, it's another example of a rooftop system where the panels are canted up from the actual angle of the roof. These are very common. These type of systems are very common in Fairbanks um, and, and higher latitude areas. Um, I know Hoodoo Brewery has a system similar to this. And I think, um, uh, a number of other um, number of other buildings in Fairbanks that are you can see as you're driving around have similar systems. 
Each of these is a different type of connector that is used to connect the rack, some of the racking that we just looked at um, to, roof to, to the roof. Um, obviously, uh, when you install solar on a roof, you're drilling holes in, in a roof. And that makes a lot of people, including myself, somewhat nervous, um, especially with all the snow and ice that we get in Alaska. Um, when I ask installers about this, they bring up the good point that um, you know, there's been something like 2 million rooftop uh, solar systems installed in this country, and um, we didn't get to 2 million systems by having a bunch of leaky roofs. So you do occasionally hear of uh, issues with leaky roofs, but it's extremely rare. Um, and I actually haven't heard of one in quite some time um, in Alaska. So um, the system here on the left, this is kind of the one that I was talking a little bit about. The flashing actually goes under two courses of shingles here. And then typically there's a little uh, like a bushing here so that the, the it actually, um, the, the flashing actually comes up and then um, the, the bolt will go into it basically so that if the water were to get into there, the water would actually have to go up and then go back down through that hole. And in addition, um, they, they seal this with silicon. Um, uh, <coughs> So that, um, so that it, it really is pretty leak proof. Um, this is an example of an attachment that would you could be found on a corrugated roof. Um, there's lots of different designs that are used for metal roofs, um, but this is just one example. Um, sometimes, if people have standing seam roofs, they actually have uh, what will kind of look like little C clamps um, that actually grab onto that roofing so that they can attach to the roof without actually penetrating the roof. Um, those are pretty popular as well. Um, and then finally, here's an example. Uh, this is actually a newer type of attachment um, that's being used. And at first I was a little leery of this because it doesn't look like much, but supposedly it's very effective and um, it's been doing pretty well, but basically it's, um, it's, it's a type of super sticky rubber um, and they use a bunch of, um, I guess like polyethylene or polyurethane roofing tar of some type. Um, and then uh, they use a lag bolt to, to go in. Um, and it's, it's important to torque it properly um, so that it has a, a proper amount of, um, of adhesion to the roof there. Um, but it's, a lot of the installers are using this as well. Um, and I promised I'd, uh, I'd kind of just touch on tracking. This is the only time I'm gonna talk about it in this presentation. Um, I will say that the beauty of solar is that there's no moving parts until you put tracking into, uh, into the system. And all of a sudden um, there's moving parts and moving parts in the cold break. Um, so there's been, an, there's been an awful lot of tracking systems installed around the state and a number of them have become fixed tilt arrays because um, they stop tracking the sun, sun at some point and they never get fixed. Um, <clears throat> so if, if folks are handy and they like to tinker and um, it's super, super important that they really maximize the, the production of their systems, then I think tracking is, is a great option. Um, but if folks just wanna install a system where they can install it and forget it, then I would um, encourage you not to look, uh, or not to um, install a tracked system um, they do make systems where they can be manually tracked. So basically, um, they, they'll be facing south, but you can change the tilt angle um, with some kind of a crank or um, some kind of a screw or something. Um, I have seen those uh, used very successfully to improve the performance of solar in Alaska. Um, obviously, in the winter, you want those near vertical, and then you can, um, you know, put them at 45 degrees or something in the springtime and the summer. Um, it's also, it is important to know that a lot of people buy those and after a couple of years, they find that they're no longer, uh, they're no longer adjusting those. They just kind of leave them uh, at the, the same angle year round. The disconnect switches, like I mentioned, are um, gonna be the next piece uh, of your, your solar system right after the inverter, um, although depending, that can depend, that can change a little bit, but um, <clears throat> they're about. And so uh, every utility will require one of these. Um, some of the utilities will require them in different places. They, 
with different lever levels of accessibility. Um, <clears throat> again, this is one of the things that if you're hiring an installer, they should understand. And if you're doing the work yourself, you should make sure you have a conversation with the utility ahead of time to understand where they need this thing to be installed so you don't have to reinstall it later. It's just a simple on off switch. Um, I think I had this on an earlier slide, but I should reemphasize with grid tied solar, um, and that's solar that does not have any storage or batteries or anything like that. Um, it will not produce power when there's a power outage. Um, so really important to understand that um, so that no one is led astray. The main reason for that is that the inverters that we talked about earlier that change that power from DC to AC, if they don't see a 60 Hertz um, grid that uh, to feed that power coming, you know, coming from the grid that they're going to feed that power into, they automatically shut off. Um, that's a that's part of their UL listing. Um, the reason for that is if you can imagine the early days of solar, um, all energy generated pretty much came from a central source, a central power plant, whether it was a hydro facility or um, a coal burning power plant or whatever it was. Um, and so all of a sudden, if there's a power outage and you have a lineman out there working on the line, um, they know that there's no power being generated. But all of a sudden, if you start to put distributed generation coming from solar on people's roofs, there's the possibility that those systems are still generating so that that line might not be completely de-energized. And so as part of the UL listing, um, <clears throat> those inverters will not generate power if they don't sense a grid. Um, and that's, that's a safety feature for uh, linemen and utility workers. Um, there are ways about that, ways around that for people that want um, to install a solar system with, uh, with a battery backup. And I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, but for the, for the most part, just understand that basic grid tied systems do not generate electricity if the power is out. Um, and finally, the, the last part of the PV system that I'll touch on is the monitoring part of it. Um, I think pretty much all installers are including this in their pricing. Um, and this basically lets you see exactly how much uh, electricity your system is generating. So <clears throat> this, you know, here are, you can see exactly how much the system is generating uh, in mass. So this particular system um, was generating, uh, looks like 2.4 kilowatts. And throughout the course of the day, they had generated almost 11 and a half kilowatt hours. And then you can also take a look at the panel by panel um, generation. So you can see that uh, looks like there's 12 panels on this system and you can see how, many, how much energy each of them had generated throughout the course of the day. Um, and you know you can compare the quarter and the year, and you can you can really drill into this uh, if you want. Um, but this was actually really useful for me last year on my own personal system. I noticed that I had this is actually my system, I should say. I had one of the um, one of the panels that was only generating about half what the other ones were generating, um, and so I, I uh, was able to get on the. Um, the inverter manufacturer's website. Um, normally, if, if you hired an installer, you would just call the installer, but um, <clears throat> I didn't have that luxury since I was the installer. Uh, but I was able to uh, very quickly um, file a, a warranty claim and they were able to, uh, because this is hooked up uh, through the internet, they, they can diagnose the problem online. And three days later, they had already had a new um, a new power optimizer in my mailbox and I was able to replace it free of charge because it was still under warranty. So um, if I wouldn't have had the monitoring and if I wouldn't have watched it, I wouldn't have known that and I would have had an underperforming panel. Um, I, we're gonna talk about battery backups here in just a minute. Um, but before I go on, um, I wanna make sure that there's no uh, questions that I can answer right now about some of the basic technology that I've talked about so far. Um, so I'll just, I don't know, stop for a minute and see if anybody has any, has any questions. So, so far there were no questions that popped into the chat, but if uh, anyone 
has any questions, feel free to unmute and ask your questions. Perfect. That means that I, either that I've explained everything perfectly or that 28 people are asleep. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, I guess I have one question. Does sure. the, when it's snow covered, do those panels melt the snow off or are they just not being able to be used? Yeah, great question. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute, but I will say that snow, uh, Panels generally do not generate electricity if they're covered by snow. Um, they do generate a, a small amount of heat, um, but it's not enough, not nearly enough, especially in Fairbanks or even Anchorage to, to melt the snow off. Um, in Fairbanks, we have uh, at our test site, our panels are at 60 degrees and um, unless we clear them, they're generally covered in snow until sometime in March. Um, so uh, that snow is a major issue in Alaska with solar. And um, just another real quick question. So in your experience with your with your solar array when you were in Fairbanks, did you find that there was, do, do you lean more towards the, the mono side or the, the bi? Polar, just more of a curiosity as far as a more roof mounted, um, but sure. I can't see the 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 back back feed being very productive. Yeah, so if you if you have a roof mounted system that's flush mounted, then I would say don't worry about bifacial because obviously you know the, the back of that panel is really only seeing the top of your roof, um, so it's not going to see a big bump from. Uh, big bump in production. If you have um, <clears throat> either a ground mounted array or maybe a system that's uh, canted way up so it's at a much steeper tilt angle than your roof, then you may see, you know, a 10% or even like a 15% um, bump in your production if you go with a bifacial panel. Um, bifacial panels used to be a lot more expensive that's really changed um, based upon some of the manufacturing and some of the tariffs that um, are currently enacted. Um, I know that some of the installers in Fairbanks are offering a bifacial option. Um, I believe there, it is more expensive in those cases um, if, uh, if folks are in, if you're interested in installing a system yourself, a lot of times you can buy online kits that uh, will have generally most of the components that are needed, and you can, you know, include bifacial panels as a as part of those kits. <clears throat> Great, thanks for the questions. I'll keep moving here. Um, so, given the amount of uh, or the number of power outages, power outages that we've had both in South Central Alaska and in Fairbanks over the last couple of years. Um, I always get a lot of questions about um, using solar for, for backup power. Um, <clears throat> and inevitably that leads to questions about the Tesla Powerwall. And so I just gave in and threw a picture of the Tesla Powerwall set up here. Um, I will say that I don't know of any installers in the state that are qualified to install the Tesla Powerwall, um, but this is generally the, the, the setup that is used. Um, so you have the battery right here, um, and then you have uh, what are a lot of times these are like essential loads. So generally like a refrigerator, um, a boiler, and then some lights or something like that. Um, and basically because those are differentiated because if you hooked your entire house up to something like the power wall, then um, it's probably not gonna be able to provide backup power for that long um, because you have all those loads attached. Whereas if you just hook up the essential loads that are needed, then it's going to be able to um, energize your house for, for a lot longer. Um, and then the main thing to, to be aware of here, then they, they have this backup gateway. And I'll go through another example here after this slide. But the, the reason they're able to do this, despite everything that I just said about lineman safety and um, inverters requiring to shut off when they don't see the grid, is this is basically uh, a little mini grid controller right here. And so what this does is, um, <clears throat> When it sees the grid goes down, it um, it flips a switch so that now instead of a grid connected system, it becomes an islanded system. 
so that that way it's no longer feeding back to uh, to the main grid. Um, now, <clears throat> the thing about using solar for backup um, in Alaska is um, some of the installers might not like me to say this, but um, <clears throat> first of all, it doubles the cost of your system generally, um, and that's an approximation, but I, I, it more or less doubles the cost of the system. The other thing is when you think about the timing of when most of our power outages occur, they occur generally November, December, and January. Um, you know, we might have some in, if in like September with a fall storm or something like that, um, but those power outages oftentimes occur during the months of the lowest irradiance. And I'll talk more about our um, uh, the amount of power that you can expect to be generated each month. But um, if you're not generating any power and you don't have a backup generator, um, once this battery is drained, then that's kind of it. Um, so just be aware of that. And you know, if this is something that you really want to go with, and you also might want to consider a plug-in for a generator too, just in case you do have a multi-day outage um, and, and you, you end up draining the battery. So um, again, without going too into the weeds, that's all stuff that you can talk about with an installer. Um, but those are definitely some of the things that I think it's important to be aware of. Um, this next slide, this actually is a system that's being installed by at least one installer that I know of in Alaska. It's a Sonin system. It's basically a direct competitor to the Tesla Powerwall. And again, this is just an example of how it would be wired. Um, here you have, just like I said, you had the kind of the mini grid controller on that last system. That's basically what this one does when it sees uh, the grid go down, then it islands the system and you have some backup loads such as lights in the refrigerator um, and then your normal loads. And so obviously if it's running just off the battery, then it's only gonna provide power for the backup loads so that it can prolong um, the amount of time that it can operate. <clears throat> and then uh, this is kind of where solar started. Um, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, when people thought of solar, they were they were talking about um, off-grid systems. And <clears throat> off-grid systems have um, some different components than the grid-tied systems. They tend to be more expensive, and they also tend to be smaller, because if you live off-grid, you're generally a lot more um, aware of the amount of energy that you consume. Um, and so with off-grid systems, you have what's called a charge controller between the solar and the battery. The charge controller just um, controls how much um, how much power is flowing into that battery so that the battery doesn't um, become overcharged um, and start to start to destroy itself. Um, in this pic particular picture, these are just basic lead acid batteries. Um, they can be quite heavy. Um, although some off-grid systems now are using lithium ion batteries of various chemistries, um, they're becoming a lot more popular. Um, and then originally in some of these cabins, you actually had DC loads, uh, especially like with LED lights and that kind of thing, because they were very efficient and that would um, make it so that you never had to use, a, use an inverter. However, most places with computers and things like that that do require AC, um, people are putting in some kind of a small inverter, um, even if it's just like the kind of thing you would get at Costco or something like that, <clears throat> so that um, so that you could use some of those modern electronics. I um, if we I'm happy to talk about this more if need be, but um, I guess I, I kind of came to this thinking most folks were going to be most interested in in grid tied stuff, so that's what I'm gonna, where I'm going to spend most of my time. Um, so as far as, you know, what angle you should put your panels at. So the, the rule of thumb in the lower 48 generally is to install your solar panels at the angle of latitude um, <clears throat> for maximum production. In Alaska, because we receive such a, um, since we receive the majority of our energy from the sun during the summer months, um, the optimal uh, tilt angle for panels, and this is true for Anchorage and Fairbanks, is generally at 45 degrees. Um, 
a lot of people like to put their panels slightly steeper than that um, to help with snow shedding and that kind of stuff. Um, but the, as an example, the, uh, the large utility of scale arrays, they generally put their panels at about 45 degrees because that's optimal. Um, and they're, they really are paying attention to, um, to, to how much energy those generate and they're really trying to maximize those designs. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, when we look like this is, these are the sun angles in Fairbanks um, and thinking about people always ask about wintertime production and, and that kind of thing. Um, so on the, on the winter solstice, the sun is just a couple degrees above the, above the horizon. Um, if you're down in Anchorage, I think it peaks at like seven degrees. Um, but regardless, I always ask people how many times they've gotten a sunburn during the months of November, December, and January. And um, I'm, I'm pretty fair and it's never happened to me. Um, it, the reality is, is there's just not a lot of uh, <clears throat> not a lot of energy coming from the sun at our latitudes during those um, those time periods. Um, so uh, just kind of something to uh, something to be aware of. And this this uh, bullseye panel right here is just a way of demonstrating that. Um, so this right here is the percentage of optimal as far as energy production, and so. If your solar panels are between 60 and about 30 degrees and 150 degree azimuth to about 210, you're gonna produce 95% of optimal. And once you get outside of some of those tilt angles, then you can see it starts to go down to 90 and 85. But you know, you, you, as long as you're close, you're gonna be getting within 95% of what you would um, any other time. So just a demonstration to, uh, to, uh, to say don't sweat it too much if you're not exactly um, due south or you're not, uh, you're not absolutely at the optimal tilt angle. Um, oh, this actually ties into what I was just saying about uh, getting a sunburn in December. So, um, you know, if you're at the equator, uh, the sun's um, radiation is concentrated over a very specific and smaller area. Whereas uh, the same amount of uh, solar radiation is more spread out in the north, um, and obviously, you know, we're actually way up here, um, and so you can uh, you can imagine how spread out that solar radiation gets the further north you get. Also, keep in mind that um, the the sun the the sun's energy has to go through more atmosphere um, the further north you get, especially during the winter months when our sun angle is very low. So that's the reason. Um, why we don't have the same uh, uh, solar resources as places that are further south, like Phoenix and, and other places. <clears throat> so how much can we expect um, out of our PV system? Um, <clears throat> first of all, so, so this is a, a graph um, based upon some modeling that I'm actually gonna go through here in just a minute. Um, <clears throat> from a, a really simple program that's produced by the National Renewable Energy Lab called PV Watts. Um, and this is the, um, the amount of energy that you can expect to be generated. So, so this is a system, it's at a 45 degree tilt angle, um, <clears throat> south facing. And this is the amount of energy that you can expect a one kilowatt array to produce each month of the year. So, Obviously, if you want to install a two kilowatt array, you can you can double this, double these numbers, and and, and so on and so forth. Um, this in this this is really optimal right here. So this assumes that there's no shading, it assumes there's no snow cover, um, and it assumes a pretty well designed system. So just keep in mind that if you ever you know when you hear of systems, especially you know around this, around Alaska that are getting over a thousand kilowatt hours per installed kilowatt. That's a really good, really well-designed system. That actually doesn't happen very often. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you know, you, you, you get the idea. You can get the idea pretty quickly that November, December, and January those are just months that your systems are not going to be uh, be producing much. And then if you have a rooftop array that um, may or may not clear snow, then you're also probably not going to be getting production in February and maybe in March, depending upon what kind of a year it is. Um, 
<clears throat> people always ask if they should get up on the roofs and clear the snow. And um, I'm gonna leave that to, to folks. I know that uh, um, I don't encourage people to get up on the roof and clear snow. To me, that sounds a little dangerous. Um, but, but again, it's, it's a personal choice. Um, so, but just you know, keep in mind that if, if panels are covered by snow, um, they're not gonna generate. So, um, and then the same is true with, with shade. Um, obviously, you know, looking at this picture right here, these pictures, th these panels that are totally covered in shade, they will generate a tiny bit, but they're, it's nothing compared to these ones over here that are gonna be in the, in the sun, so just to kind of keep that in mind. Um, so I'm gonna quickly um, run through this PV Watts demo. Um, I'm actually gonna stop sharing my screen real quick. And then, So you should see PV Watts up on the screen now. Um, and so you can, honestly, the, the way that I find this every single time is I Google PV Watts, although if you want the URL, there it is. Um, <clears throat> and so this is the first screen that uh, will show up. So I'm gonna just put Fairbanks, Alaska. I'm gonna try here. So there we are. Um, and so it, it's using uh, a weather, um, weather data from the National Renewable Energy Lab. And it knows we're in Fairbanks. So that's great. So keep going there. And the next thing it says is, OK, how big a system do you want to design? So um, for now, let's just say we want 2 kilowatts. Um, for module type, you can do standard premium thin film. Um, I always keep it on standard. Uh, it, if you wanted to do premium isn't really bifacial. It's just like a high efficiency uh, module, but you could probably use it to, to, to improve, to, um, to model some bifacial. Um, for the racking, fixed racking uh, or roof mounted racking, the reason that that matters is because fixed racking is gonna allow more air movement around the modules. So they're gonna be more efficient. But for this purpose, we're just gonna use roof mounted. System losses, 14% is the default. I always just leave it at that. Um, you know, if you wanna uh, learn more about that, they, you can really dive into that and get really into the weeds here, but we're not gonna do that right now. Um, for a tilt angle, um, 20 degrees, I think that's about a 312 pitch roof, give or take. Actually, no, I think it's actually a 412. Um, I, I, it's right in there. Um, so let's leave it at 20 for now, and then we'll do a south facing system. Um, since uh, Fairbanks has, I think it's about 25 cents right now for residential power. I think it just went up. Um, and then, so we've got our system design. If you want to use some of these advanced um, parameters, you can, um, but for the pur this purpose, we're not going to worry about that. And from there, you just click, uh, click the button, and it's going to say, okay, Here's what you can expect your system to produce. Here's, here's the input. So here's your solar radiation. And here's the amount of energy that you can expect your system to produce. Um, for, this is the two kilowatt system that you can expect your system to produce in a year. Here's, the, uh, here's how much that energy is worth. Um, and then if you want to download your results, you can do that on a monthly or an hourly basis. It kind of gives you. Uh, Gives you all this um, information. Just remember again, I'll emphasize this is um, not taking snow coverage or shading into account. So these are this is an optimal um, an optimal system. So pretty straightforward. Um, I will say that as you get down to Anchorage, for some reason, um, PV Watts is a little glitchy with their uh, the weather data sets, and so sometimes you have to refresh some things or maybe pick a different weather data set. Um, 
we've been in communication with NREL to try to get that fixed, but you may notice that if you if you come south of the Alaska range a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing and go back to the presentation here. Let's see here. Um, Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so talking about the value, we talked a lot about uh, you know how um, solar in Alaska, uh, how we're not going to produce the same amount of energy that we we do in a place like Phoenix. Um, with that said, um, that doesn't mean that solar doesn't have a high value in Alaska because if we look at the um, the the, the solar, the amount of energy that solar's that a solar uh, panel is going to produce, you know, we're behind Chicago and Seattle and all those places. But when we look at our electrical costs, um, we're quite high. We're second only to Honolulu uh, in this particular example. Um, and actually, this is somewhat dated data, so this bar should actually be even a little bit higher. Um, so when we actually look at the amount of savings that we can expect per kilowatt of PV that is installed, it, it puts us uh, squarely in, in the middle here um, uh, so that you can see that, uh, you know, even though we're not producing quite as much power, or quite as much energy as you would see in other places, um, we're still getting uh, uh, good payback for those systems. Um, <clears throat> I'll stop again here. Is there any, any questions? Yes, there have been several in the chat. It Perfect. might be easiest if yeah, I can just go. I can just go through them here. Um, so there were several regarding the battery. Uh, then regarding yeah, the using the battery, battery for load saving during the summer months. Okay, save over production from the day and run stuff at night. So um, <clears throat> that actually ties really well into net metering. Um, so I, I'm actually going to save that for my next slide. Um, same question there. Um, so, uh, Alina said, I've seen some apartment buildings with panels that are completely vertical. How effective are they? Um, so they are effective. They're not going to be as effective on an annual basis as um, you would see if you had uh, panels that were at 60 or 45 degrees or even 30 degrees, um, but they're still very effective. In fact, if you look at their generation in uh, like January, February, and March, they're going to produce better than some of those, um, those tilted uh, panels. Um, but on an annual basis, they're not quite as effective. But Again, if, if that's where they had the space, then th that made sense for them. The other thing is if they're on apartments, then um, there's, it's possible that, there's, uh, that they're being installed on a commercial basis. So commercial PV has some additional tax incentives um, that can be used. Um, so someone says, I have a three kilowatt bank that's vertical, it self clears. Oh, okay, so they're actually a big proponent of the, the vertical array. So yeah, um, and so, and they're off grid. And so I actually, I've seen this a lot where people that are off grid, they, that, that, that winter time energy is really, really important for them. Um, and so um, that's actually a great example because if you're off grid, you really need to maximize the amount of production in, um, in the winter. And uh, then even though you might not be getting uh, quite as much uh, in the summer because there's so much more radiance in the summertime, uh, it's not a problem. So that's a good example. It kind of all depends on your use case. Uh, yeah, so um, Joe asks, is the DC watts the same as microinverters? So yeah, that the, 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 the rated size of your system um, in kilowatts, like when I say it's a two kilowatt system, um, that's generally, that's the, uh, the size uh, from the modules. Um, so for example, if you have four 250 watt modules, that's generally referred to as a one kilowatt system. 
The caveat is sometimes the utilities want to know the AC size of your system. And because for them, that's the maximum amount of power that they're going to see being back fed into their grid. Um, and so they may want to know the AC rating. And so sometimes you can, um, you can actually have more DC, have a higher DC rating than the AC rating. Um, so there are examples where maybe you have a one kilowatt array, but the AC rating is say 800 watts or something like that, just as an example. Uh, yep. Um, so another comment here about from about snow cover um, and, and you know how much energy should be. Uh, should be subtracted for snow cover. Um, I, I would actually say I'll go back. You know, if you look at this slide right here, uh, you know, obviously November, December, January, February, and March, like you can start to add up some of these numbers here, and you can say, okay, we just lost twenty percent or thirty percent of our annual production because of snow. So it's important to understand that um, and to keep the expectations realistic and. You know, I should say I'm a big proponent of solar, but I also want to want to make sure that people have realistic expectations that it's not it's not a magic technology. Um, some of the research we are doing is to find new ways to clear snow, um, but it's a, actually a pretty hard problem. Um, Jeff asks, any experience with using a solar diverter for a hot water heater? I don't have any experience with that. Um, there is uh, a device called a sun bandit, which basically uses solar PV direct to a hot water heater. Um, there's a guy here in Anchorage that markets those. Um, he thinks they're great, but he sells them. So, uh, but, but, but I don't have any direct experience with those. Um, I know of an installer down uh, on the Kenai that I believe he has tried ordering those. Um, basically just switching out the hot water, the heating elements in a hot water heater um, so that they can run off of DC instead of AC. Um, and I think he had a good experience with those, but this isn't something I've done directly. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, okay, yep. And then someone says that the solar diverters are very popular in Europe. So again, interestingly, um, so you could call them dump loads as well. Um, so when a system is overproducing, where can that excess power go so that you can maximize its value? Um, as an example, in some of the, the rural areas of Alaska, especially with wind power, they might oversize the wind system so that when a system is producing more uh, power than a community can take it at a particular instant, they'll feed that excess power into um, either some kind of a hot water heater or um, an electric boiler or something like that. And then that electric boiler can then be used to heat a school or a hospital or something like that. But that's for much larger uh, systems. Um, generally, uh, the, the heat load in Alaska does not line up very well with the solar resource. Obviously, like this time of the year in March and April, there is some good overlap. Um, but, you know, the, the, the coldest months are earlier in the winter when our solar resource isn't as, uh, isn't as strong. So, um, I will move on since I think I got all the questions. Feel free to keep asking those. Um, so there was a question about using batteries to um, basically to, we're not, we're not talking about load shifting, but you're shifting the production uh, so that you can use the energy produced during the day, during the evening. Um, so batteries are a great way to do that. Fortunately, in Alaska, we have a policy called net metering so that we can, uh, people that have solar can essentially use the grid as their battery. Um, net metering was first enacted back in 2010, and it allows customers to, um, net their renewable energy production um, on a monthly basis. So in some parts, in some states, it's actually on an annual basis, but in Alaska, it's on a monthly basis. Um, and, and it allows customers to receive retail credit for the cost of their, the power that they generate up to their, their monthly, their total monthly consumption. Um, and as an example that here, you can see that 
Um, if there was no net metering, anytime your renewable energy system was overproducing, um, the, the power would be purchased at the avoided power cost for the utility. So for most utilities, it's generally like how much is the utility paying for, for their fuel? Um, I believe right now the avoided power cost for Golden Valley is 13 cents and their retail uh, cost of power is about 25 cents. Um, so that's just an example. Um, so you can see that net metering really improves the, um, the economics of, of these systems. Um, a few things about net metering, it does have a maximum uh, size for net metered systems of 25 kilowatts. That's very big for, for a residential system. Um, however, some, some large uh, business systems have, have pushed up against that. Um, and the utilities were required to allow net metering um, up to an installed capacity equal to 1.5% of their average annual load. And I have a couple asterisks there because um, as solar systems have become more widespread, um, they have uh, um, gone above that 1.5% in I believe all utilities on the rail belt now. Um, and as, the, as that's happened, um, utilities have raised um, the amount that they're willing to allow. So I know that GVA, they raised it to 3%. Um, in Chugach Electric, they just raised it to 5%. I think Homer is up to, I believe it's 7% of their average annual load. The only one that hasn't ra raised it is Matanuska Electric. Um, and their reasoning for that is that they say that's the minimum that we that they were required to allow and they are letting people go beyond that um but with the understanding that um you know that they don't have to um so it's a different reading of the regulations and the other utilities had but no one has cut off uh, rooftop residential grid tied solar in the state to date um <clears throat> So again, just looking at some, some economics and net metering. Uh, so you can see all the different charges that you see uh, on your utility bill. And again, this is for Golden Valley. Um, these figures are generally available on uh, all the utilities websites. Um, I pulled this earlier today from the GVA website. Um, so you can see that if you buy energy from GVA at 25 cents per kilowatt hour, um, any energy that comes from solar, instead of purchasing it uh, from the grid is gonna save you 25 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, if, you, and, and if you produce more solar energy than you consume, then you have a, a net negative. Per, uh, and so then GVA credits you at the 12 cents. So for example, if your system produced a thousand kilowatt hours and your home only consumed 800 kilowatt hours, then uh, GVA, then you exported 200 kilowatt hours um, net to the grid. And so GVA is going to credit your bill for 12.9 cents times uh, 200 kilowatt hours production. And that'll go onto your bill. And usually it ends up going against this customer charge right here. Um, which is where, uh, you know, it's, so it's pretty rare to actually see a negative bill, although it does happen from time to time. So get now, now, now that we know what net metering is, and now that we um, can, have started looking at some of the economics, we can start talking about, okay, so what's the, for a grid tied system, what is the optimal size system um, to install. And it, that really just depends on what your motivation is. Um, so if your motivation is to install the smallest system you can to maximize your payback, um, then you know you might be installing a system like this 2.9 kilowatt system here. If your motivation is to go um, go net zero, so basically produce as much electricity as you consume on an annual basis, then you may install uh, a system that produces in line enough energy uh, similar to this, this gray line here. Um, <clears throat> by the way, this blue line is, is your, your electrical consumption. Um, 
So it really depends on what your goals are. Uh, maybe you want to go somewhere in between there. You know, it's it's uh, it's always nice not to have an electric bill that's more than about five dollars. So maybe you kind of want to go between there, and maybe you want like a four kilowatt system or something like that. Um, it just depends. And again, if you're going to um, hire an installer, this is a conversation that you should definitely have with that installer. Um, you know, maybe if you consider efficiency first, you can bring this blue line down a little bit. And then you can, that means you can, you can either install a smaller system or um, you're going to overproduce a little bit more. So you're going to have more, uh, you're going to zero out your bill more. Um, it all just depends. Um, yeah, I'll kind of move on because we've got some more examples of that here. Um, so when we talk about solar payback, um, and generally, you know, I, I guess I should have used a different word because SPV could be solar payback, but uh, generally people are talking about the simple payback of a system. So how long is it going to take before the cost of the system is offset by the amount of electricity that it's saved? Um, so here's a very simple um, equation to calculate that. Um, subsidies is basically tax credits. So um, this year there's a 26% tax credit um, and that tax credit um, is basically uh, anything towards the cost of your system. Um, and so you can see that under this simple example right here, there's a 10 year payback. And that's pretty common for uh, well-designed systems in Alaska that don't have, um, that don't have too much shading. But kind of the unknown in this example is what will future electrical rates be? Because if electricity goes up a lot, then obviously it's going to improve the payback of your system. So if, if you do get a, um, uh, a bid from an installer, pay attention to what he's using for a utility escalation rate, because that's one way that they can um, make uh, make, make the payback of systems look, look quicker than than they might uh, otherwise be. Um, I've seen utility escalation rates ranging from 3% on up to 8%. And I think 8% is uh, a little overly optimistic um, or, or pessimistic if you're someone that doesn't like to see electricity, <laughs> your electricity rates go higher. Um, the current tax credit scheme. Um, so the tax credit was at 30% up until 2019. Um, in 2020, it went down to 26%. And this is something that kind of changes depending upon the whims of uh, Congress. Uh, there's been several times it's looked like it was about to go away and then some bill went through and solar tax credits were attached to it so that they've been extended over and over and over. Um, but last year and then this year, the tax credit will be 26% for residential solar. Next year, it will be 22%. And then in 2024, only commercial systems will get uh, the tax credit, and that'll be for 10%. Um, and then also, I know this isn't this, this we're not talking about commercial solar here, but um, there could be some, some good uh, incentives for commercial solar, especially uh, in the Fairbanks area. There's um, actually a 25% grant from the USDA that you can apply for if you're looking at commercial solar. And in addition, um, there's accelerated depreciation that can be used. So you can really get the paybacks of solar in Fairbanks uh, to look very attractive. Um, I'm gonna show a quick example of an online solar payback calculator that we've uh, put together. Um, Cause I think it does a good job demonstrating uh, some of what I just talked about. Um, so I'm going to go open that really quickly here. I guess maybe before I do this, I will look at this really quick. Um, make sure there's questions here. So, and there are a couple of questions. Yeah, I see this Golden Valley level up each month. Yeah, all the utilities will, will uh, level up month to month. With that said, uh, if you have a negative bill one month, they'll generally just credit that uh, to the next month's bill. Um, so they're not 
they really don't send you a check. Um, maybe they will if it goes on for two months for too long. Um, I'm not sure, but I haven't seen a check or I haven't talked to anyone that's received a check. Um, what are the current rules for self-install on and off grid? So I was a self-installed um, system. Um, basically, if you go to the utilities websites, um, they generally have a, an interconnect uh, packet of paperwork. I would recommend reading that. Um, and if you have any questions, contacting the utility directly. But they do a really good job of um, saying exactly what you need, what you know, what the one line needs to look like. Uh, generally, what you're going to do is you're going to draw a one line and get the spec sheets for all the equipment that you're thinking of using. You're going to give that to them, and then they will approve it. Um, if you're in an area that requires building permits, then you'll probably have to do that for uh, either the municipality or the city or whatever community you find yourself in. Uh, is there a tax credit for landlords? So, hmm, I'm gonna say yes, but I would also say talk to your tax professional because I'm not an accountant. Um, and uh, when we start getting into the weeds there, I wanna be real careful not to offer tax advice. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, and sellers told me it was once a year he got a check. Well, so, if you put a massive system on that offset all of, you know, a huge amount of your, your power um, so that you were running a, um, a surplus every month, um, that's possible, but that would really be a huge system. Um, uh, okay. And people are, so people are posting links and that's appreciated, great. Um, so I'm going to run through this solar payback calculator really quickly here, um, and then we're almost done. So this is a solar payback calculator. Um, my colleagues, uh, Ben Loeffler and Michelle Wilbur put together, um, so all the credit goes to them. Um, <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> this is basically data that comes from PE watts that I showed earlier, but it's pretty simple and it's we just put it together this year. So um, trying to get the word out. So for, for this example, since we have a lot of Fairbanks people on the line, we'll just say that we're living in Fairbanks somewhere. Oops. And basically what that's doing is it's telling um, the program what uh, data set, what weather data set to use. So um, we have the pull down here. These are these 14, 18, 22, th these are basically, um, so these are tilt angles, but the reason these look kind of funny is because these correspond to common roof tilts. So like a, a 212, 312, 412 tilt. Um, but in this example, let's say we're gonna do a ground mount array at 45 degrees. Um, and so you put your tax credit in, since it's this year, we'll use 26%. What is the life of your system in years? I would say the minimum life of your system should be 20 years. Um, uh, inverters have uh, warranties ranging from 15 to 25 years, depending upon the inverters. So that's another thing to check um, as you uh, as you start to look for equipment and things like that. But let's just leave that at 20 years for now. Cost of your system in watts. Um, again, that depends upon the size of your system because uh, if you have a really big system, then there is some economy of scale there. So the, the actual cost per installed watt is going to go down. Um, but since we decided on a ground mount system here, let's, uh, which tend to be more expensive than roof mounted systems, let's put it at, let's say 350 a watt right here. Um, and then the size of our system, uh, oh, check, and then right here, check here if your utility will allow you to net meter. We do. Um, how much do I pay for electricity? Uh, 24 cents here. What's the avoided fuel cost? I think I said earlier it was 12 cents. Uh, and again, you can get these numbers off of the utility websites. And then you put in your monthly electricity consumption. So, so I don't have to go through all this right now. I'm just going to leave these at the default. Um, these would be pretty low. I think the average, for example, the average Chugach customer, I believe, uses 600 kilowatt hours per month. Um, and then 
what it does is it goes through and it says, okay, the quickest payback for your system is going to be a system of this size, so of two kilowatts. So maybe you need to go back and you need to say, well, if, if, if I'm only going to put in a two kilowatt system, um, the cost was actually going to be a little higher because it's such a small system. Maybe I need to raise the cost to 375. Well, let's call it 380. There you go. Um, and so, but what it's doing is because we get so much, uh, such a ho much higher rate for uh, electricity um, that we are able to consume each month than when we overproduce by a lot. This basically is a simple program to match your monthly um, consumption with the monthly production. And so it tries to um, match those. It says, you know, is there a month when, um, when those two would be equal? And that's when, that's what it says is your, your quickest payback. Um, and so you can see this particular situation, the payback was 11.5 years. Um, if I say, well, actually, you know, I wanna install a bigger system. I wanna install a four kilowatt array. Then you can look at this and you can say, okay, cool. So I'm gonna be overproducing on average for these months right here. It bumped my payback up um, a little bit, um, but uh, there it is. So um, anyway, pretty cool little program. It's very simple and uh, it's just a good little way to, uh, to start to start to look at some simple designs um, of your system. Um, as far as costs, the installed costs of systems, um, I've noticed a really wide variety of the installed cost of solar this year. I think it really depends upon when installers purchase their materials and whom they're purchasing them from. Um, some installers had a really big bump in costs based upon um, the rising cost of panels and, and that kind of stuff. Others have been able to keep their costs um, pretty similar to what they were in past years. I know in Anchorage, um, just as an example, since a five kilowatt array is pretty common, a five kilowatt array was about three, between three and 325 a watt. Um, depending upon what installer you went with. In Fairbanks, I think it's probably about 50 cents a watt higher, give or take. Um, don't hold me to those numbers, but that's just a really quick down and dirty observation that I've seen this year. So, um, And then finally, do this really quickly. I have one more slide. Uh, um, this is a, the Solar Design Manual for Alaska. This is a document that I wrote with the help of some others um, with cooper at Cooperative Extension. It's a couple years old, so it's it. I need to I need to get out and um, and revise it, but it still has some really good information, and it has a lot of information about off-grid systems as well. If you're looking for more information about that, there's the link. Um, it's free to download, um, and it's also linked at the ASAP web page. Um, and then finally, um, here's all these resources I promised with links. Um, one thing that I didn't mention at all um, was uh, this GVEA reference on their website. Um, it's a really great reference about standby or backup generators. Um, and it has a lot of like one line diagrams and goes pretty into the weeds. So if you really want to educate yourself about that, I would highly recommend you look into that. Um, and then if you're looking for more information on uh, some of the weather data and some of the accurate modeling information and um, the payback, um, there's a YouTube video right here that um, my colleague Michelle Wilbur put together that's on the ASAP webpage. Um, and there's links to the calculator that I just went through. Um, and this Solarized Facebook page um, has a lot of really good information from various uh, presentations that have been made. I think I might even be on one of them. Um, and so you can, you can kind of check these out uh, on your own. But that's what I have. Um, so with that, I'll see if there's any last minute questions here. Um, oh. No, I just put in the oh, links that okay. you shared. I just put them into the chat so that Great. people can access them immediately. And Perfect. 
Jace, I guess I forgot to ask you whether it's okay to distribute the slides or not. Yep, absolutely. And if it is, then we will be mailing those out uh, perhaps tomorrow. Yep, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then we do have a few more slides just about the Solrise campaigns that uh, Lauren can share. So, if anyone has any questions right now, uh, maybe just wait until she finishes. So Chris, if you can hold on and people can sure. prepare questions and in a few minutes, ask you any other questions. Absolutely. So Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted to give um, kind of a quick overview of Solarize Fairbanks um, and like the current like communities that are solarizing in 2022. Um, so it's a community led solar energy initiative. It's a bulk purchasing program. Um, essentially with the idea that the more like neighbors and communities and businesses uh, come together to uh, put in solar systems on their homes, the cheaper it'll be. Um, they can kind of make deals with uh, different installers. Um, and they also have an energy efficiency component to the campaign. Um, so you can get uh, discounted energy audits um, if you live in some of these communities. Um, and it, so it's a coalitional effort between Information Insights, uh, Northern Alaska Environmental Center, the Alaska Center, um, ASAP, Native Movement, and the Fairbank Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition. Um, and I'll send out these slides as well so you have access to the links to the Facebook page and website. So the two areas that are solarizing in 2022 are Denali and University Heights. Um, and I've also included the links to their like sign up page. So you can either sign up to just get email updates to say that you're interested for like future years, or if you live in Denali or University Heights, uh, you can participate this year. Um, and this is their email address, solarizefairbanks at gmail.com if you have any questions for them. Um, and then they have their energy efficiency campaign component. So um, if you sign up there, that's where you can get um, a discounted energy audit uh, this year as well. Um, that's that was my quick little <laughs> little overview, um, and we can go to questions for Chris now. This is awesome. So anyone who has questions, uh, please um, unmute yourself and uh, ask away. And Chris, while people are thinking of questions, so I'm curious for the inverters they are smart, so they won't put power into the grid if they don't see the 60, uh, 60 hertz signal. What happens to that power? It just, it's like an open circuit. So they just don't produce that power. Okay. Yeah. It's different than a wind turbine where you have to have a dump load or something like that. Um, just, uh, just stops producing. It's like yeah. electri electrical magic. <laughs> That is great. All right. Lauren, I have a question for you. And um, if people whose community has already been with Solar Fairbanks, but they didn't do it, I because I got faulty information when the person came out and talked with me, both about the rebate and, uh, and probably the trees that would have to be cut. Can we still... Um, use the program this year, even though it's past my area? That is a great question. Um, I'm not sure if you're able to install this year. Um, I would honestly reach out uh, to that email address and I can, uh, I'll put that in the chat. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. I know um, you likely still have access to energy audits, um, but I don't know if you're able to participate. Okay, because I've done the energy audit years ago. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, I guess the other thing is, you know, you don't have to be involved with Solarize to contact an installer and just to kind of have come have them do a uh, do a site assessment at your house. Um, so. Now it looks like we have a couple questions in the chat. Yeah, um, so I'm gonna read these. It says, why does anyone put their panels in portrait orientation in the north? So. I've never seen panels oriented north in Alaska. You do see that in Hawaii, and that 
area. Um, um, I noticed a lot, lot of orientations. I find the snow melting from the top that a landscape is way better. So that's actually true. Um, because of the way that solar panels are wired, um, if you have a, a panel that is oriented in landscape orientation, um, as this snow um, <clears throat> melts off of that panel, the, um, the, uh, the panel is gonna actually generate uh, more electricity. So for example, if, if it, after it melts off that first third of the panel, then it's gonna generate 30% of the electricity that it would if it were completely uncovered and then so on and so forth. Whereas if it were horizontal, or excuse me, if it were in vertical orientation, um, then the as the snow melts down, even if it's uh, only 10% of that panel is covered, if that bottom 10%, if it's that bottom 10%, um, because, because of the way the panel is wired, um, it's not going to generate any electricity until it's completely uncovered. I um, hope that was somewhat clear. Um, and then off, so ground mounts can be cleared by from snow uh, easier, absolutely. Um, the other thing to pay attention if you're considering a ground mount is how high that bottom row of panels is above the the ground. A lot of times around here, you'll get, uh, you know, the snow will come off the panels, but then it will build up on the ground and then keep building up um, on that array because the, 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 the array isn't quite high enough above the ground. Um, it, Jimmy says, is there an advantage to adjusting PV array tilt closer to 90 in the spring and then 45 for the summer? Yeah, there, there is an advantage there. Um, a 90 degree array is gonna perform better in the winter and the early spring. Um, and even probably like later into the spring because you're gonna be taking advantage of some of that bounce um, off the, the white snow. Um, and then starting about now, you know, now or maybe another week or two, um, reorienting that to a 45 degree tilt. Um, you're gonna see better annualized production if, if you were to do something like that. Again, it's it's you know it's it's a trade off. How much more does that system cost to install based upon a rather than a fixed tilt system? So um, that would be something to look into. Awesome. I was going to say that was it for the questions, but there is yeah. Uh... How much of the optimizers? Oh man, I wish I wish I remembered. Um, so I want to say the inverter was about $1,000 and the optimizers were, I want to say less than $100 each, but don't hold me to that. I would encourage uh, you to look online. Um, there's a whole, there's lots and lots of uh, places online where you can buy uh, kits or different PV components or, or things like that. Um, and you're welcome to email me and I can try to find some of those addresses for you. Otherwise, you can just ask Mr. Google. Yeah, I, microinverters are the way to go with grid tide. Um, I definitely think a lot of, that's what the installers, that's what the installers think. Um, so uh, they definitely make it simple. They're pretty plug and play. All right, so it has been an interesting evening. Thank you very much, Chris, for sharing all of the information. I am putting down my email address into the chat. If uh, anyone has questions, that one is the easier one <laughs> to deal with, dana at cchrc.org. So if you have any questions, let me know, and then I can ping Chris or the right people. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to GBA for uh, sponsoring this series together with multiple other sponsors and thank you Chris we really appreciate your time great have a good night everybody take care